Hello, Howie Bentley here. Welcome to episode number 10 of Sword and Sorcery Heavy Metal. The video you're about to see is a roundtable discussion between me, Jason Tarpey, the vocalist for Eternal Champion, and Deathmaster, the vocalist for Italian epic heavy metal band Doom Sword. We're also joined by moderator Justin Young, who runs the Monsters, Madness, and Magic podcast. The video was originally published on the Monsters, Madness, and Magic channel. Justin also joins us in the discussion as well as moderating. And I would like to thank Justin for not only sending me his edit of the video, but giving me permission to publish the video on Sword and Sorcery Heavy Metal. On to the discussion. All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you all again. Uh, before we dive deeper into some of the topics we had planned, uh, you know, just in case folks aren't familiar, this is their first time tuning in. Thought it'd be a good idea if we went around the Zoom room here and gave a like some brief insight into your introduction to the genre. So maybe uh, I guess we'll start with Howie, Jason, then we'll go Joe, and I'll round it out, and then we'll we'll be off to the races. You know, I, a, there are a number of things leading up to it, but um, mainly, you know, I was getting into uh, reading Savage Sword of Conan when I was um, a teenager in the eighties, in the early eighties. And then I saw that movie, John Millie says, Conan the Barbarian. And that really made me want to go out and find the, the paper. I'd seen the paperbacks in the store before so with the Frank Frazetta covers. And I picked those up. Uh, I guess it was Lance, um, Lance Ace paperbacks or Lancer. And, uh, and just really got into reading that. At the same time, I was reading some sword and sorcery comic books, you know, in my early teens in the 80s, like Arax on a Thunder, Arion, Lord of Atlantis, and that kind of thing. And, you know, the time I'm older than you guys, obviously. So the time I was growing up, these movies were coming out, I guess because of the success of uh, Milius' it's Conan the Barbarian. There are all these other movies coming out, too, like uh, The Sword of the Sorcerer, uh, Beastmaster, and, and all these things, too. So in a way, it was like, for my father's generation, my father grew up in the 40s and 50s, and there were always Westerns on television, Western serials, and, and Westerns on cinema. And, and to a, a lesser degree, that was the way of it when I was growing up in the 80s, was this sword and sorcery. And there were a lot of fantasy movies, too, you know, like high fantasy and stuff like that, like Dragon Slayer and that kind of thing. But I was more into the hard as nails sword and sorcery. And I would just pick up every... Back then, things, you know, obviously it was um, pre-internet days. So you would... <laughs> take what you could find, then you go into a store or a bookstore. And I was reading some of those Conan pastiche novels, and then a little bit later on, I got into Death Dealer novels by uh, James Silk. It says James Silk and Frank Frazetta on the covers. But uh, anyway, it just sort of uh, went from there, and I uh, really got into, I was really into heavy metal, too, at the time. So I decided to eventually put those two things together. And I won't go into all that. Maybe we'll <laughs> We'll talk about that later, but I want to give the other guys some time, too, so I'll, we'll, we'll move on. Jason Tarpey, uh, so my introduction to the genre I, was similar to Howie's. Um, when I was a kid, I probably got a hold of the Conan comic books first or seen the Conan movies. I can't remember which was first. It's probably the movies, actually, now that I think about it, because comic books came after I was watching those type of movies. So I think the introduction was probably Conan the Barbarian, then Conan the Destroyer, and then uh, Beastmaster, Dungeon Master, uh, you know, all those movies. Prowl. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and so then it probably came the comic books, and I don't think I was aware of the literature yet. I don't think, you know, I wasn't aware of Robert E. Howard in, in the genre as a whole. Like, I kind of just was drawn to those movies and in the comic books i wasn't so into the superhero thing i kind of like how we looked for the the conan or the a rack or the you know the slightly the next tier barbarians <laughs> yeah. uh what do they call them uh clonans yeah <laughs> right and so uh i got into the comic books and later i kind of i didn't i wasn't a big reader you know, even into my early 20s, 
so I kind of had that in the background. I really liked fantasy, but it was really just that was the extent of it was movies and comic books. I was in a hardcore band called Iron Age before Eternal Champion, and we were really influenced by this band called the Icemen, who are a New York hardcore band. And they had a song called Shadow at a Time, which is the H.P. Lovecraft short story, of course. And the song was about that story, but I didn't really get it from the lyrics. I was like, what are these lyrics about? And so my friend actually knew about H.P. Lovecraft, and he was like, oh, song's about this writer. And I was like, oh, I thought that was a movie director. I think we talked about this yeah. before, Justin. Yeah. And so that was my introduction, was finding Lovecraft and then finding out that him and Robert E. Howard were kind of part of the same circle. It was after Lovecraft that I went and read all the Conan stories and then found Brand Morn and, and all the other characters I kind of just dove in head first I didn't stop reading for like a decade after that just <laughs> absorbing everything so awesome and how about yourself Joe what was your introduction my introduction was really unusual uh this movie called Conan the Barbarian <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah I got hooked ju just the same way I would add um Excalibur at um uh, a real pull uh, and um, and I would even say that the Arthurian cycle itself uh, I don't know if you want to call it sword and sorcery it would be forcing the term um, although I think you could definitely call it fantasy and it, and it is going back in time a, a long long way um, but yeah that's Conan and Excalibur are the two movies that pulled me in. And then um, uh, Tolkien, I think it all snowballed at, at the same time. I like, like Jason, I don't think I was a great reader. But then possibly because I didn't really find anything that I was really interested in reading. Because then when I discovered Sword and, Sword and, Sword and, Sword and Sorcery, and Dungeons and Dragons and heavy metal, it all became one big snowball that became an avalanche. And that was it. All right. And I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record, you know, John Millie's Conan the Barbarian. But just like Jason, I would say my introduction was more from the horror side of things. I grew up in a lot of horror movies. So similar to Jason, I thought H.P. Lovecraft was a director till I start looking into it. You know, this guy's a writer friends with Robert Howard and then you just kind of you just kind of slide in the back door and you you find Robert Howard Clark Ashton Smith and then you just go down the well another thing all you guys obviously have in common is on top on top of sort of sorcery is your your metal uh, background so you implement the genres into your music so can you each speak a little bit about you know the importance of sword and sorcery as it's expressed in your in your music it was really just a natural progression for me uh it was like every band that I joined I didn't, was a, in any really good bands, even, you know, like try to play in some cover bands and stuff. But my, my real goal was to form a, you know, a proper heavy metal band. And people kept, and I grew up in rural Kentucky and everybody kept saying to me, we need to move down further south where all those heavy, you know, that people into all that heavy stuff like you are. And uh, people kept saying Atlanta. And I moved there in 88 to go to the Atlanta Institute of Music. And my idea was to form um, when I finished there to form the ultimate heavy metal band, to me, the ultimate heavy metal band, the band that I always wanted to hear myself. And I was into all these themes, and uh, I would always, you know, if we would start bands or whatever, I was always the lyricist. Nobody could write lyrics, and it really just was a matter of um, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. You know, <laughs> I could write lyrics a little bit and really got into that. And uh, I just wrote about stuff that I just naturally gravitated toward. I wasn't interested in mundane things like relationships and politics and social issues and all this crybaby stuff. So I wanted to get into um, kind of stuff I, I like to read about. And I started writing lyrics like that. And it and it just sort of snowballed to where I was doing more and more of that. And, and the more I did that and then the more attention I got for doing that, then I kept reading more and more sword and sorcery until it just became this pure thing. It was just sword and sorcery, heavy metal. And, uh, and it's pretty much, you know, the same thing that, um, that uh, Jason and, and Joe do with their bands um, is what I would call sword and sorcery, heavy metal. So that, um, that 
was is pretty much the story in a nutshell. Gotcha. Now, Jason, you said you started out in a punk band. What was the what was the thematic shift for you? Well, as a teenager, when you're in a like a hardcore band, your world is so small. You kind of write about your friendships as kind of a trope. You know what I mean? And maybe I did that for a while in my in my first band. And then by the time I got into Iron Age, I was like, I can't like how we said write about relationships, mundane life, politics. I, I like I shouldn't have any place telling anyone how to live. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the whole moralistic view of writing songs did, did wasn't appealing to me. And so I kind of had to think about what kind of lyrics I like. And I like lyrics that have stories. You know, I think that songs can just be like a movie or a short story. And I'm thinking about the stories I like now. I'm reading uh, Robert E. Howard and Clark Ashton Smith, Lovecraft, Michael Moorcock. And as I'm forming Eternal Champion, the goal is just to write songs that you can follow along with the lyrics and kind of give homage to the story to pull you in. You know, it's a little bit of escapism, but it's also engaging. I mean, just because these songs are about, we'll call it sword and sorcery or fantasy, just because they're about other worlds doesn't mean they're unrelatable. They're still about humans. You know what I mean? They're just, uh, they're people that we that we make up, that we see ourselves in or uh, see other people, our enemies. or You know, you can't help but kind of project yourself onto these stories. Or if you're a writer like we are, projecting yourself onto these characters so there's just a very human engaging element in writing about these stories they're so visceral and they're so emotional and that's kind of what music is good for is conveying emotions and that's kind of what these stories are full of even if it's like two emotions <laughs> like anger and <laughs> uh you know battle lust so you know what i mean it's yeah. just <laughs> Well said. You can't help but be like enthralled by it, and and so that was that was the goal I I saw. I was like, well, oh, it's not only is it an homage to the genre which I love and in these stories which no one's really reading anymore. When Eternal Champion started, I was like, well, I can do that, and I can also for people who don't even care to read the story or care about the genre at all can also just be pulled in by the human or relatable elements of the stories so that, that was the goal well said how about you joe mainly it's escapism uh, i have to confess like mm. when probably the world you live in you're not quite satisfied with you start dreaming of other words um but um as far as the actual influence of sword and sorcery in uh, doom swords music i would say the biggest influence was Michael Moorcock. Um, and I, I I found that that the the contrast of law and order and the hero of the story being a, a complete anti-hero was was the reason why it had such a heavy influence on on me because you go to write music, you go to to write lyrics. Uh, you 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 strive to communicate like a feeling, uh, which for me the the keyword is epic. Because above all, I mean, we can talk about sword and sorcery, fantasy, but the the keyword I associate with my music is epic. You 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 try and kind of picture yourself in certain situations, maybe living in uh, being a character in the story. I always thought I'd, I I wouldn't be a kind of Conan kind of type. <laughs> um, uh, I would be more, you know, the guy that um, ends up being a protagonist in the story, but maybe has some darker side to them and it's not necessarily all out good. Um, but by, by all means, Conan wasn't, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, being, a, yep. being a kind of an archetype character, you know, he was all out something. Um, whereas um, Michael Moorcock, uh, I mean, the attractiveness of Elric compared to other characters is its complexity, other character complexity, and how Moorcock developed it. So, yeah, and that's that's why that's why it features so heavily, and not necessarily explicitly. I mean, like we we've done songs about uh, Elric, the 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 contrast of 
uh, order and chaos, inner conflict uh, that's always present and it's more or less always deriving from from Moorcock. In fact, the last album we published a long time ago now is mm-hmm. called The Eternal Battle, which really just refers to your own yeah. internal battle that's never ending, right? So, yeah, that that's it, really. That, I would, that would be a, a summary of it. Joe, I can't believe I've never asked you this, but when you're growing up reading this stuff, are you reading it in English? So that's that's a cool thing. Uh, oh, by the way, when I say that Moorcock influenced, um, I don't know if I ever said this, uh, I, I wanted to call the band Stormbringer, uh, but there was already uh, about 100 million Stormbringer <laughs> bands. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, a friend of mine uh, that run, nowadays runs a distribution called Iron Tyrant um, in, in Italy, uh, he had a, a much greater familiarity with the English language than I did back then. And a um, couple of days later, I don't, I don't know where he goes. Uh, you know, the way you were looking for, a, you know, the band name that was basically, you know, give me Stormbringer, but not Stormbringer. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, what about Doomsor? Um so uh, that's what I went with. But yeah, back to your question. There's a, a moment in time. So I moved to Ireland in 2004. Mm-hmm. So before then, I read and watched movies um, in Italy. Didn't do any English at all. In fact, um, you could argue I didn't have much English. <laughs> and and you, could, you can even see it in the lyrics. In the pronunciation of 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 the words in the in the songs, like in the recordings, and even even like the uh, resound the horn, that's like grammatically <laughs> incorrect. It was a play on sounding the horn, but because it was the second album, it was resounding, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but because it was so, it was it was very wrong. It was ne- it never came across that way. <laughs> I never thought twice about that title. Me ever. neither, dude. You I just love love, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, because you get you you like a sound resounds, but you cannot resound anything. You know, sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, still works. Uh, so then after that, I I I started reading in English. Um, so there's the stuff I read before, and it's the the stuff I read after, and there's fortunately a few things uh, like. Tolkien, Moorcock, and all of the major movies I managed to double. So, um, yeah, I knew them in, in Italian, but I read them again in English because obviously the original, whatever the language is always, if you can read the original in its original language, it's definitely the superior version. Mm. Um, so, Did- yeah, that's it. Just curious on the same while we're on that subject, did you ever notice any differences in any uh anything that got lost in translation from Italian to English when you read them in the other languages? So I'll be hard pressed to n- name examples, like specific examples, right. but yeah, plenty. Lots lost in translation. Or maybe approximated rather than bigger because that 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 was the best thing you could do. You know, right? Uh, like I mean, I read uh, an English translation of the Divine Comedy. Mm. Nah, <laughs> forget <laughs> it. <laughs> no point. <laughs> Just curious, also, uh, Howie and Jason, uh, Howie was it always Cauldron Born? You know, Joe said he was um, Doom Sword was a, a Stormbringer. Was it always Eternal Champion with you, Jason? Yeah, it was always Eternal. From like it, the band name came first, actually. I think so. Mm. It was just it, 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 it. I knew right away that we weren't going to be writing songs about. Uh, oh, it wasn't going to be it just about Michael Moorcock uh, stories. It was just we chose Eternal Champion just because it's a kind of an all-encompassing kind of uh, like a name that readers of the genre will, will know. You know what I mean? It's kind of like as, as Joe said, it's important to have an epic, even when it comes to your name. It should 
kind of evoke an epic feeling. And so Eternal Champion does that. And it's just kind of a, you know, it's, it's just got, it's a cool concept. Also, as Joe just said about the law and chaos, such an engaging, uh, it's so much uh, more relatable than good and evil. It's been done to death and it, we've all seen it in so many forms. It's such an archetype that the law and chaos is such a trope breaker. And Elric is such a trope breaker and he's so much more relatable than Conan. You know, I mean, reading the Conan stories for the first time was, you know, insane. It's really visceral, visceral experience reading them, but it's not like you really feel like um, you're Conan unless you're like, I don't know, like a wrestler or, a, <laughs> you know, or like a combat veteran. You know what I mean? Yeah. Something like that. But right when you read Elric, you're like, OK, not every protagonist in these stories is like Conan and every person that tries to write it just a Conan type character fails you know you just we already have it you know what I mean yeah. you have to think of something new so that you know that was why we chose Eternal Champion because uh, it's just a it's just a cool name and a, and a cool concept by Michael Moorcock so what about you how was always Cauldron born for you yeah I I read this book the Black Cauldron I guess I was 10, 11, maybe even 12 years old, something like that. I was fifth or sixth grade, something like that, around that time in the 70s. And um, the I thought the book was pretty lame. I was reading better comic books. And by then, I'd moved on to Doc Savage paperbacks, and, and even those were better than that book. But there was one thing I really liked about it, and I think I, I read it for some kind of a – it was not like a competition, but this academic program where you get some kind of a – a ribbon or something if you read these books. I just did it for the hell of it. I think I got extra points on my grade or something for doing that. And um, so I read this book, The Black Cauldron, and the only thing I liked about that book was the, the Cauldron Moor. The Cauldron Moor are these dead warriors they put in the cauldron. And this is based on Welsh myth, I guess. And they put these dead warriors in this cauldron and cast this spell and they come back to life as these, um, you know, undead warriors. And... Um, and the Calder Moor are like these demonic things. And um, so that really left an impression on I me, mean, the concept of Calder Moor. And that name just really stuck with me when I was a kid. I'm like, I'm going to use that for something one day. I don't know what. And I was, I've just gotten into music around that time. I was like, nah, I couldn't use it for anything to do with music, but I'm going to use it for something. And then <laughs> later on, when I got this idea, you know, the, the whole sword and sorcery metal thing was coming along, I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to form a band and I'm going to call it Calder Moor. And, uh, and some guys even made fun of the name. They're like, yeah, Calder Born, Skillet Born, or whatever. And I'm like, no, man, you're, you're not. You're messing up. <laughs> you don't know what's going on here. So, yeah, it was it was always Calder Born with me. It's a great name. But it's one of the best. <laughs> I love it. I love it. With I didn't know the how it works with the, with the, you know, the C, with the hand and everything. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, I always thought it was to do with, like, um, witchcraft you know mm -hmm. um, a real kind of uh witchcraft aura to it a lot so it looks like the album cover with the you know the rising out of the cult yeah the yeah and, it's you know, it blends in perfectly yeah i know yeah actually I, I i know uh i'm gonna feel free to digress a lot because i have a very fond memory of called and born so after um we we did this demo in three days um we reached an agreement with underground symphony and we went to visit their offices and the guy had just moved from his old place to the new one and um didn't really have furniture lots of uh, boxes of cds everywhere he had a desk and a chair for himself but not for anyone because he didn't receive that many guests um maurizio uh, um so he he said um uh sit down and then looked around I mean, no chairs so pulled some uh boxes of cds and vinyls and then you know and he's gonna pitch to um try and convince us to sign for underground symphony which he didn't need to do but <laughs> i was already fine with that <laughs> uh, um he was showing me how well he was working with um with bands and she made uh gave me the cauldron born born of the cauldron cd um because that, that that's 1997 is it not that's um, 1997 yeah and you guys released um your debut album i think a year later didn't you 
yeah. right after that. It was right after that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, recorded in 98, maybe very, very early 99 came out, uh, something like that, yeah. So actually, that would make it 25 years old in, <laughs> in, a, little, cool. in a little while. Uh, that's it, yeah. I remember Maurizio telling me about Doom Soul. Um, I was talking about doing another album, and I asked him how, how the reception was to this kind of heavy metal because when we did that album we were almost too proggy for traditional metal fans and we we're too traditional for prog metal fans you know people listen to dream theater and stuff like that and of course on uh, underground symphony i think the only two bands that were doing this kind of metal was called born and doom sword and he he mentioned doom sword he's like well we'll see when the new doom sword album comes out um you know how things are and uh, so he, he he was very confident in in that release, but uh, yeah, we were the only two. And the rest of the the it was mostly Italian bands. I think there was maybe one other American band that I could remember on Underground Symphony at the time, and that was Jack Frost Band. I think it was called Frostbite, and that wasn't any kind of metal. It was just some kind of hard rock kind of stuff. But um, and all the other Italian bands were playing the symphonic power, prog power kind of stuff on the label. So we had like the only two bands, Doom Sword and Calder Born, that were this kind of a true metal bands on the label. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to ask you guys, so we've been talking about sword and sorcery, obviously, but where where's the line in the sand that must be drawn at some point in the story where we have sword and sorcery on one side and fantasy on the other? What's the what's the distinction to you guys? Well, one of the things with sword and sorcery, I think, is it's it's a bit darker. The protagonist tend to be a bit morally ambiguous and self-serving. Uh, everyone from Conan to uh, Elric to uh, Carl Edward Wagner's Cain, not to be confused with Solomon Cain by Robert E. Howard. But these these characters are, are more morally ambiguous and they tend to act more on their own, whereas in, in the Tolkien-esque type, which is high fantasy, Tolkien-esque branch of heroic fiction, you have more of this this group kind of thing going on. It's almost like a a D and D game, and where these group of people are working together, and it's it tends to be for a cause. They're they're driven by some sort of cause. It's almost like it it's their destiny. They were destined to do this, or it was fate that they they were chosen to um, come up against whatever is. Uh, considered evil or wicked and to bring it down. Whereas a character like Conan or Cain, they um, are doing things that benefit them. They just happen to be on the right side of the argument in the situations they find themselves in. I, th I think that's right on. Yeah. I mean, that, that was really... <laughs> yeah, how he, how he just nodded out of the park for everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think he's right. I mean, sword and sorcery also team uh, tends to be a short story format, which I think is kind of important for the genre because it's good for short for sword and sorcery to kind of pull you in and keep you there and read the whole thing in one, so you kind of stay in it. You know, because that's kind of the point of these stories is to be a little bit more fast paced than a three hundred page fantasy novel. It is more interesting, I think, to have these morally ambiguous, self serving characters. You know. And it, how he's right about that again it's uh it's usually about one or two like a you know like a fofford and gray mauser type situation or uh you know niphthalene is always with a, a companion so you know it, it can kind of break those uh barriers a little bit you don't know if it's fantasy or sword and sorcery i think there's some books like that we might discuss one later but that that was right on from how he got i don't have much to add other than yeah it probably usually contains some horror elements sword and sorcery almost always seems to have a horror element and it, it's really hard to tell if it's even fantasy or horror that's well that's my favorite kind of thing i really like when the horror is so strong that you know it's it's not really clear 
what genre it is, you know. Joe, uh, right before you go, you said you started with uh, Token. So how was it, you know, from going from high fantasy to sword and sorcery? Did you notice the distinction? Very much, yeah. In fact, my answer was going to be that, um, well, I mean, echoing Jason, I think uh, how his answer was right on. But um, in my head, because I, I see things a little bit in, uh, in in sets. So if you got like the whole fantasy genre is big, one big set of <clears throat> uh, literature, um, um, then you've got, uh, fa within fantasy, you got, generally speaking, high fantasy and low fantasy. And I definitely think that sword and sorcery would be a subset of low fantasy. So I uh, don't think it, it, you can call anything that has a, a spell every two seconds, uh, sword and sorcery. It, there has to be, uh, there has to be a darker element, but also the the sorcery needs to be sorcery. So sometimes, so, you know, whoever performs it would be like the one character in the story that that does that. It's not like every every you know blasting fireballs at each other. Right. That's not sword and sorcery. Um, so that that's more or less the only addition I would have is that to me, sword and sorcery is also if it, if it's high fantasy, then there's no chance it can be sword and sorcery. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, in the horror elements, definitely. I mean, uh, I, we, we're uh, recording the new album, and we've done a three-part song on um, on the Scarlet Citadel by yeah. uh, Howard. Um, and I would, you know, if you read the whole thing, um, the the whole thing wouldn't even be sword and sorcery. Yeah, it is. But really, the sorcerer, when when uh, when he's chained down uh, in the in the dungeon and has to escape, and meets all these kind of horrors and saves a a sorcerer, that that's real sword and sorcery, right? Mm -hmm. To echo what Jason was talking about, that's that's the core of sword and sorcery for me. Then when Conan breaks out and goes to uh, save. Um, you know, Shamar with open pitch battle and all that. But it's just epic. It's not sword and sorcery per se. But, mm -hmm. Right. You just broke the interview, Joe, dropping uh recording new Doom Sword album. That's all we're gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> I just got so excited. <laughs> You know, before yeah. the, before I move on from there, just the uh, I I make a own distinction, my own distinction between magic and sorcery. You know, like you said, Joe, magic is, you know, everyone has it. Everyone has fireballs, or you know, there's there's a race that knows magic. But I view sorcery as, it's heavily in. There's there's stakes. You know, there's going to be consequences. There's great uh, loss that must be had to use this. You know, there's that's that's how I make that distinction there. Yeah, you know, it's always like an unpredictable force that turns on the user usually, or it's usually hated by the protagonist. Like Conan hates it because yeah. there's no controlling that. You know what I mean? There's just it's unpredictable, and so he would hate that. You know what I mean? So right, makes sense. Right, and you know, just uh, speaking of generalities, you know, there's a lot of varied material out there, but it seems you know more often than not, the the sword aspect seems to be up front. With a you know barbarian leaning protagonist trying to vanquish the sorcerer, but you know how do you all feel about the shoe being on the other foot? You know maybe with a a more magical leaning character having the sorcery at the forefront. You know, and can you think of any examples of that? I like um, Carl Edward Wagner's Cain stories, and of course he is a swordsman, but he's also a sorcerer. I guess some readers think of this character as a villain. He's the villain is the protagonist of the story, Cain. And uh, so I like the characters who use both. Um, I can't think, I mean, I like some of the, the villains, the um, villains like in Howard stuff. I mean, the, the source is what I'm talking about, they're villains. But as far as, a, you know, a benevolent sorcerer or a sorcerer who's working on the side of what we would, I guess, perceive as good, the only one I can think of would be um, from the Solomon Cain stories would be Enlonga, mm. you know, the old black African juju 
uh, wizard who, who'd also learned white man magic when he was a slave. He's the only one I can think of that would be uh, using sorcery for good. But I've always leaned toward these characters like um, Kane and, and Elric to a degree. Elric, he he uses sorcery and, and drugs just to stay alive. Yeah. And he's from a race, the Melnabonians uh, practice magic. And then he comes into possession of this magic sword that gives him strength. So, you know, you've got the sword and the magic there. But um, that that's what I lean toward. Yeah, I got to agree with Howie with the cane. I mean, he's, I think Carl Edward Wagner makes it either into my top three or top five writers of the of the genre. And so uh, even though Kane is such a bad guy, you know what I mean? You can't, you're still kind of rooting for him. You know yeah, what I mean? That's, it's very yeah. interesting. He's got a charm but about it puts him. you in a weird position as a reader. You know what I mean? So, and Kane does use uh, sorcery for his own ends always. You know, he's just so self concerned always. And then he's always plotting <laughs> with people. He's such a, he's so cunning. You know what I mean? He's always, there's always like tears to the plot and, and revelations in the end. And, you know, Kane just uses anything he can. What he's, he's very pragmatic, you mm-hmm. know, in, in his, uh, in his use of it. So, but, it, you know, it comes back to bite him, you know what I mean? In most, most times. And so in Elric's a, a good pull too. I mean, he uses sorcery just to stay alive, to be strong kind of differently than Kane. He's not using it, uh, to build an empire. I, Elric isn't even in, interested in empire building it, you know, in the beginning he wants to shirk off his empire, you know what I mean? And, and his the sorts of sorcery element is, uh, more medicinal, you know what I mean? And right. I guess then, then it comes later, he uses sorcery in all kinds of ways, but, uh, yeah, those are two really good uses of, of the sorcery in, 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 you know, the genre. Well, actually, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not going to deviate for me, Elric. Uh, and I was specifically thinking of when he invokes Ariok. That, that's proper sorcery. Yeah. So forget spells and everything. Invoking a Lord of Chaos, sorcery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dictionary definition. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going. I'm going to stick with the gentleman's answer and adding that. You know, we're all writers here. Do you guys have uh, specific stories that you go to when you're looking for a kick in the ass, creative wise? Not really. I read a lot of nonfiction too, um, history and like about historical battles and stuff like that. I've been reading off and on a book called The Bandles about. Um, Genseric or um, Geyseric, um, which was the um, oh the, uh, the leader of a Germanic tribe that um, one of them that brought down Rome in its final days. But um, so I read some of that stuff. There's nothing I really read to. I reread some stuff every now and then, um, but there's nothing I really go back to, to for any kind of inspiration for something I'm writing. Well, I really like uh, kind of outliers in the genre. I really like Michael Shea. You know, he's such a weird writer. You really have to pay attention to his stories as you're reading him. His, his prose is kind of stilted, and it can be hard to follow, but he's a really good writer. I, I admire. I love uh, Fritz Leiber, Carl Edward Wagner again. He's just a big inspiration, I think, Wagner is to me. I like going back and reading Lovecraft and finding that magic again when I first read it and trying to get that feeling again. That's really inspiring. So Lovecraft's one is just like an old standard that uh, that inspires me. But And also lately I've been reading a lot of uh, like Splatterpunk, uh, David Show, and um, I've been reading uh, Wraith of the Broken Land by S. Craig Zoller, mm. uh, which is really gritty. Uh, Western, I don't know what to compare it to, like maybe Blood Meridian or something like that, you know. It's so that stuff does inspire me too, you know what I mean? For like the uh, the fighting element, you know what I mean? I, I kind of look to Shea as an inspiration for uh, world building. His environments are so strange and alien, you know what I mean? They're so interesting to read about. And Lovecraft has all the atmosphere I want and the cosmicism I like, right. Uh, Carl Edward Wagner brought in the kind of amoral character that, you know, is kind of interesting, which I like. So, yeah, those are some of them. I'm totally with you on the Lovecraft. The more you inch away from Lovecraft and then you come back to him, you realize just how 
much he stands out from his peers just in terms of mood. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Joe? What do you go to to get the spark going? So I think if I uh, have to give a, an answer at any moment in my life, you say, what, what, what you go back to, that would be Howard. But um, not Conan, though. Um, I think um, uh, the Bram McMorn and the call stories are the ones that really, uh, I don't know, they, they have something more in them. I don't know why, maybe the character, I don't know. Just to give a, a slightly different spin, I'm a very oral and also a visual person. So um, for me, illustrations, paintings uh, are actually what get me going with, uh, for inspiration. That's why I'm surrounded by them. I can't see, but I can see the bottom of the, that dealer there. Yeah. Um, um, and also, uh, this this is a bit unusual. There's this uh, YouTube channel called the Cyberarian. No, I don't know now if I'm allowed to <laughs> drop the names, yeah, but sure. the Scottish guy that does uh, narrations of um, well, for for the majority, it's Howard stuff, and his interpretation is out of this world. Like really, um, I if you, if you were to pick one story just to get an idea, I would say either Del Carter's Cat or uh, Night of the Kings. Uh, one is a cult story, the other is uh, uh, Bram McMorn. Bram okay. McMorn actually wake call in it because he comes yeah. into the future from. Uh, and if you listen to, to those stories, all the accents this guy pulls off, the atmosphere he injects in the story. I don't know, maybe because it's coming into my ears rather yeah. than through my eyes. Uh, music is for the ears, so maybe it should come in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, but yeah, that, that, that would be it. Looking at paintings, I have got a lot of uh, books of uh, illustrators, not just Prozetta, even though he'd be my main influence. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's basically it. Here's a question I got for all you guys. What would you say is the uh, the most rare physical copy of a book that you own? Well, um, that's hard to say. Probably, I don't know about rare, but they certainly go for a pretty penny. Would be I, I have a number of of collections of, of books like that, but probably my most expensive collection would be the Centipede editions of the yeah you know what i'm gonna say the i knew you're gonna say that. <laughs> the um that would probably be that and then i've got those death dealer paperbacks i've got all four of those and those those are exorbitant um <laughs> and um i've got carl edward wagner's uh exorcisms of ecstasies um so quite a quite a few i mean i could i've got every flat surface in my house is covered in books <laughs> As and be. um so yeah, I've, I've got a ton of stuff like that. Those uh, Wagner uh, centipede press uh, things you were talking about—I don't think they go less for than four figures now. No, right well, around. or three at least. Yeah, yeah. Uh, high three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's some of those that you see that I think I saw some that was like eighteen hundred, two grand, or something like the other day for the whole set. Jesus. They were oh, signed wow. by the artists. Oh. Yeah, I saw so, that too, Howie. I, I saw that. <laughs> I mean, even even the ones that aren't signed are um, just astronomical. Yeah. What about you, Jason? What you got in the uh, dungeon? I wish I had it behind me. I have a, a Carl Edward Wagner. It's it's called an author's choice. Uh, it's a hardcover, small hardcover, with just Carl Edward Wagner stories, and it's got River of Nights Dreaming. Uh, maybe at first just ghostly. I'm trying to remember what's in it, but it's signed by Carl Edward Wagner. So I like that I have his signature a lot. Wow! I found it in a bookstore in Seattle at the last time Eternal Champion played there last year. We were just went to this bookstore before the gig, and I saw the book. I didn't know what it was. I'd never seen it before. It's author. It says author's choice on the cover. It's got a, a sketch drawing of Carl on the front. And I saw that and I grabbed it. I was like, holy shit. And I looked at it. It said $75. And I was like, oh, I'm buying this. And I looked and it had that 
autograph in there. I was like, holy shit, $75. This has got to be like hundreds of dollars. Bond. And it just became like a treasure immediately. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen that? Had. You guys, have you seen that? The Office Choice hardcover I'm talking no, about? No, I haven't seen it. I might slip out and go get it and come back in sure. just to show it to you because yeah, I've never seen another one. Yeah. And uh, I've got a few Arkham House first editions that I, you know, that I treasure. That's Those are probably the rarest things I have. Joe, you got anything on the shelf back there? Well, uh, okay, N nothing on Word, but uh, as in that would be actually worth money. But if I were to choose, what, what I feel is the most precious is this um, version of the Vanishing Tower that has been uh, illustrated by Michael Whelan. And because um, obviously there's also the illustration side of it, right? Michael <laughs> Whelan. Right. Um, and there's uh, these drawings in it that I've never seen anywhere in a, like, they're just amazing. Wow. Um, uh, I'll show you another couple because they're out of this world. They're all um, Waylon? Yeah. All the, the, the whole book is illustrated by, uh, it's like having a, a uh, huge series of Siritongo covers. In the, yeah. The book. <laughs> uh, this one's unreal. Oh, wow. That's Corum, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, nothing that would be actually worth amazing money, but certainly uh, dear to my heart. Awesome, man. So we kind of touched on this already, but something I definitely wanted to touch on was uh, underrated, you know, sword and sorcery gems, novels, short stories, whatever, you know, maybe more unknown, uh, obscure writers or unknown stories from popular writers. What do you guys have in that regard? Well, um, you know, so people either love or hate, but I mentioned just a minute ago those Death Dealer novels by James Silk. And uh, they do get progressively weaker as they go. And, and like I said, there are four of them. They're much better than the Glenn Danzig comics. You know, as try as I might, I could not like those comics because the artwork was great in the Glenn Danzig comics. I, I guess it's Verotica or Verotica or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they look great, but there was little to no script or story there to them. Um, kind of like you know his his first horror movie. I haven't seen anything he's done after that. But you know, I'm always rooting for that guy, but it just always doesn't <laughs> work for me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, back to those novels. James Silk. It says on the cover by James Silk or Frank Frazetta. Of course, Frank Frazetta didn't do any of the writing. He created that the character, and it was around all this time, and people were wondering what the hell is that because the the other like the um, the Kane books. You know, you had some Frazetta art used on that and you go oh, that's Kane when you see it or you know that's Conan but then you see these death you're like, what is what is this guy so James Silk wrote these novels and the first couple of them I think are really good so, like I said people either love them or hate them so that that's some obscure stuff um another obscure gem that I would recommend that readers pick up is um the Sorcerer's Shadow by David C. Smith it's one of my favorite um sword and sorcery novels of all time and um and then, of course, you know, there's um, Ramsey Campbell's uh, Ryer or Ryre, however you say the character's name. But the, that was published by DMR in Far Away and Never, the whole collection. And that that is the best collection to get. I mean, it's been published before that, but it has uh, all of Ramsey Campbell's sword and sorcery, other than things he'd finished like fragments for Robert E. Howard or, uh, you know, whatever, just yeah. they, or he had collaborated with other writers. But uh, that that's a really good obscure sword and sorcery novel from somebody who, not novel but collection, from um, somebody. And, you know, I've said too. You've got to be, and you guys were mentioning horror, and I've totally neglected this in the conversation. But I believe you, a, a writer needs to be very good at writing horror to be good at writing sword and sorcery. And Ramsey Campbell is a master of horror. And when you asked that question earlier, I was kind of like a deer in the headlights. I didn't know. I didn't expect that to say, what What do you read? What's your go-to to sort of inspire you? What I'm reading more than anything as far as fiction, I should have said said this, was I read, uh, I mostly read horror. Man. Mm -hmm. I, I read horror far more than I do 
sword and sorcery. And my two main horror writers are Thomas Ligotti and Ramsey Campbell, uh, especially Ramsey Campbell's short fiction. Some of the novels, you know, I'm kind of lukewarm on, but I really like his, his short fiction, particularly his old short fiction. But uh, anyway, long answer. I'll let somebody else talk. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be in the right mood for Ligotti, man. <laughs> yeah. You got to block out a whole month for Ligotti. Yeah. You got <laughs> Go to clear, you clear your calendar. <laughs> You're in for a depressive episode. Yeah, that. yeah. Um, well, me and Howie, I, and we're all of the same mind here, I think, a lot, because every time Howie says something like that, <laughs> to it, you know, because I was just going to say David C. Smith. I do love The Sorcerer's Shadow. That's a great book. Um, I also love his character, Oron. Uh, mm. Oron's great. Um, those books are awesome. If you want kind of a, uh, someone who's kind of like in between a Conan and a Kane, would you say that, Howie? Would you agree with that as an Oron? I mean, yeah, it's kind of a he's a dark figure, kind of like a dark that. figure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the bull man. I would recommend David C. Smith for that. Um, before I mention Michael Shea, but I would really tell people to to search out the Nift the Lean uh, book and the uh, a book he wrote called In Yana: The Touch of and Dying. It's they're so weird. I mean, they're like the weirdest sword and sorcery I've probably ever read. It, it maybe the only comparison would be like Jack Vance or um maybe Gene Wolf or something like that mm. because it's very weird. Um but once you get to the end the payoff is so good and the characters are uh, really bad. There's so many <laughs> there's so much uh gruesome depictions of things. The there's so many um like florid uh vivid descriptions of gruesome things you know what i mean it's uh it's just something you don't always get so i would recommend michael shea for that and, and like how he said thomas Legati, he has a really great story i think it's his only real i mean you could call it sword and sorcery but um it's probably philosophical horror in the guise of that it, it's called masquerade of a dead sword that's a that's mm -hmm. a great story i recommend people go read well, I hate to forget something. Every time I do one of these, I forget <laughs> someone. Maybe if I do Clark Ashton Smith is a good one. I mean, he's pretty popular and people know about him, but I don't know how much people really read him anymore. So right. I would say that too. Oh, in the Ramsey Campbell, I got to say, people should really get that uh, collection of Ryer stories. They're really good. I think you do need to write horror to be a good sword and sorcery writer, and Ramsey Campbell's one of the top guys that we're actually, <laughs> I don't even know if I should say this because people, we're trying to write a song about changer of names. So that'll probably be like uh, somewhere soon. I well, really love that story. Here, man. Yeah. I'm not nearly as knowledgeable as the other two gentlemen. But um, and so I'm hoping that when I say, uh, oh, this, this is the book I thought was lesser known, but they're not going to go. And that's complete mainstream. <laughs> but um, one of the one of the novels I really enjoyed, and it's very early uh, fantasy. It's uh, Eric Bright Eyes by H. Ryder Haggard, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know. I I classify that as sword and sorcery, or to, at least to an extent. Um, and it's got this great quality that. Uh, Broken Sword uh, picked up later on of kind of pastation, uh, Viking Age uh, um, tales with kind of a bit of magic thrown into it. And it's 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 kind of dark. Um, there's romance into it also that comes with the context of the years when it was written in, I think, that, you know, Romance was a big thing in in those days, but um, yeah, Eric Bright Eyes would be one of the the books that when I say, "Hey, have you read Eric Bright Eyes?" Everybody's like, "No." Uh, I have not read that one. I haven't either, but I did buy it on your recommendation, Joe. So I still have it on my reading pile. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> most of my it's, recent readings have come from all you guys you know howie uh richard tierney and joe was the reason i read the broken sword and why i had a probably like a depressive episode for a week after reading it <laughs> uh, look there's a there's a thing right epic is a big word right mm. and i think that for me uh epic 
has a, a kind of a tragic quality and the broken sword and Eric Breda is just do a massive job of that. <laughs> yeah, well, I know what to expect You want to be in a good mood when you're... <laughs> Noted. <laughs> you're not going to be after. Uh... <laughs> so uh, did either of you guys, uh, Jason and Joe, did you guys have a chance or time to read the Richard Tierney? Any of Simon Gita stories? Yeah, you know, I said that I hadn't written... I hadn't read a Simon and Gita story, but I realized I did. I read uh, The Ring of Set before because it's in Swords Against Darkness, number one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just forgot about it. Once I went back, and I was like, oh, yeah, I read this story, of course. It's a great story. That's the only one I've read is The Ring of Set, but it, it is really great. I have a lot of questions about where the character goes. I, I know that he – there was a lot of collaborations. I think uh, Robert Price wrote a story. Yeah. Right, yeah. with him. It's in, the, uh, it's in that collection. And it involved – Right, and he kind of wove in like a Gnosticism to the all the all the other mythos that's involved in the historical fiction. I generally like the historical fiction angle. You know what I mean? Like the Simon of Gita is kind of a lot like uh, like Brand MacMorn. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the historical fiction of the Picts. It's just kind of ripe for that uh, injection of horror. You know. And the fact that it's kind of a Lovecraftian mythos horror is perfect yep. for us because we're just going to read it as fans anyway. The, Simon was kind of, to me, he was kind of similar to Cain in that he's a biblical reference. You know what I mean? Because so Carl Edward Wagner's Cain is, is based off the bi biblical character of Cain. And, and so is Simon of Gita, is Simon Magus, right? Yep. In the Bible. Right. So right. there's that really interesting element. But I think a lot of this stuff that is like um, historical fiction that might interweave Lovecraftian mythos or a horror element is it doesn't have like the oppressive uh, cosmicism, you know what I mean, of uh, the source material of Lovecraft, you know what I mean? Like Lovecraft would look at the little dealings of these cultures as just moments in an uncaring universe you know what i mean yeah yeah so i guess there's that there's that there's that it, it's almost like writers as fans of lovecraft writing fan fiction you know with their own characters and using history as the backdrop and then interjecting the lovecraft as kind of um fans or to have that horror element because it doesn't get any better than that to have something eldritch and or you know so old Right. Just the fact that things are so old is kind of where the horror comes from. So uh, I really enjoyed that story. I got to read the rest of them for sure. Yeah, uh, you'll love them. And just before we get too far into Richard Howie, you knew Richard personally. Uh, for people who may not be familiar, why don't you just tell us a bit about Richard's work and how you uh, came to know him? Um, well, Richard, how I came to know him, I'm trying to think. Um, I had come into contact with somebody at, at one time. You know, back in the 90s, when I really got in, early 90s, when I really got into all this sword and sorcery stuff, I I met a lot of people that were sort of musical idols to me. And that really held no, I really had little interest in that anymore. But I got so much into reading these old sword and sorcery books, I was like, I was just fascinated by these people who wrote them. And I wanted to reach out to some of them. And, and I had contacted a, a handful of guys. And I managed to get an email for Richard and got in touch with him. And surprisingly, he was very cordial. And um, um, we started a correspondence. And uh, and I'd read, I'd first discovered Richard's writing in, um, Jason mentioned uh, Swords Against Darkness. And matter of fact, I have those right here. That, mm. uh, can you see the whole book? Do yeah. I need to hold it up further? Okay, so this is Swords of Darkness, Volume 1 which was published in 1977, and it had the uh, Ring of Set, was the first um, Simon of Gitta story. And then these are all Simon of Gitta stories I'm referring to. And then in volume two, it was also in 1977, was um, The Scroll of Toth. Mm -hmm. and, and then 1978 was volume three that had um, The Sword of Spartacus in it, which I hijacked for a Calder Morn song and made it about my own thing. It's... Uh, <laughs> You know, involving the Calder born um, mascot, <laughs> Thorn. Right. But uh, anyway, so I started this conversation. I'd read a bunch of his stuff already, and, and I guess he maybe thought he was kind of forgotten or whatever, and he was glad to have 
somebody who was interested in what he was doing because to me he was like a just an iconic figure and uh so we started this correspondence and we talked for a while and we talked right up to his death he died in uh i think 2022 he was born in um 1936 he was born the year robert e howard died and i think um andrew offit andrew j offit who uh was a renowned science fiction and fantasy writer he edited these um swords against darkness book and he even may uh speculated that you know maybe jokingly that uh richard was robert e howard in incarnate <laughs> or reincarnated rather because he uh he died the year uh or he was born the year Howard committed suicide right. and died. So anyway, Richard once told me he had more in common with Robert E. Howard than any other writer that he felt that he did. Um, so, but he was also really into um, the history of early Christianity, history of um, ancient Rome, um, just would take years and years of reading to get to the point he was at to be able to to implement the kind of detail in the stories that he did in mm -hmm. those Simon of Geta stories as far as Imperial Rome. So there was, uh, he, like I said, he was interested in early Christianity, the history of early Christianity. He had given talks. I know at least one, when I was still uh, talking to him right before he died in 2022, he um, had given a a lecture at a church a while back um, on the history, early history of Christianity. And he was also interested in Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, basically in a nutshell, at least as it applies to what we, we read, is, okay, so the world is created by an evil God. And um, that's, and as it applies to somebody like the fiction of H.P. Lovecraft, or even more pronounced in Thomas Ligotti's work, you have the macrocosm, which is whatever your concept of the source of creation is, beating down on the microcosm, which is man. And that's um, cosmic horror, and I use this word again in a nutshell, is that um, you have the macrocosm terrorizing the microcosm. And so that's kind of where the Gnostic thing comes in. Um, really to, to get by it deep into the Gnostic um, background of Richard's works, I would recommend talking to um, Robert M. Price. Have you, have you talked with him about, I haven't, I haven't talked with him yet, but I'm going to reach yeah, out to him. He would be him. a good guest to have on here. He also is publishing, um, he was the heir to Lynn Carter's estate and he's publishing flashing swords uh, again, which is Lynn Carter's fantasy anthology from, you know, way back in seven. I read uh, Swords Against Caesar. So that would be gotcha. the, the origin of the character, I suppose. So first of all, I loved it. Um, and it, it invoked a number of weird feelings. Um, because for a start, how, how am I going to put it? If you read, uh, if Howie read a, story by Moorcock that said um, and Elric drew Stormbringer and said to the people of Atlanta, Georgia and you'd be like, what? <laughs> um, because <laughs> because all of the places are <laughs> yeah are, I don't know, my, my father was or uh, so you know flicking a sword and sorcery novel but also with familiar places in it was uh, very, very strange. Never felt that. So <laughs> it was a first. <laughs> um, secondly, um, I also felt a bit stupid because I started writing my own novel. Um, I'm not a writer, despite you saying, you know, writing and being a writer, different things. Um, I try. <clears throat> and um, uh, so the main character would be this uh, uh, early Middle Ages monk that performs a like a reverse uh conversion so he goes from being christian to a pagan um because of let's call it divine intervention um awesome. like the opposite of of 
Jesus. He's a Christian, but Odin kind of makes it clear you're Odin incarnate. So off you go and destroy the whole Christian mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> reality. Um, and the reason why I felt stupid is there were so many commonalities with uh, with Simon. Uh, you know, the kind of focus hatred on something in particular for him. It was Rome. Um, and the uh, the setting, so all these kind of Latin names and uh, uh, Roman culture popping up because early Middle Ages really, at the time of uh, Germanic invasions, um, the, the main culture is still uh, still Roman with a heavy Byzantine uh, footprint. Uh, yeah. So aside from from these, which are just my own personal. Uh, um, um, impression uh, or or rather feelings that the feelings that the novel has stirred i i just um i just loved it i loved the i loved the restrained use of of sorcery how it was like used uh uh here and there but when it was used it just punched you in the face i i mean one of the first, one of very early scenes when um, uh, Simon's in the arena and uh, with the sword of Spartacus mm. somehow, you know, killing uh, killing causes the Etruscan demon to come yeah. down from the sky and blast 50,000 people um, and then leave the whole scene, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the massacre of... It was uh, it was unexpected and very uh, uh, you know it felt like watching a movie, but a really well done one. And mm. uh, uh, but yeah, I, I like I, I I will summarize it like this after this rambling. It was very classy. I like when you've got something as powerful as magic, but you use it uh, with with a drip. And when you knew you use it, you do it really well. So, yeah, I was very much appreciated, and I will be finishing uh, the whole Simon Gera uh, corpus. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Because one of the things that stood out to me reading it, uh, just Richard's historical prowess, and you being Italian, it probably even stands out even more so to you. Actually, you know, living in the region and knowing personally the locations that he's speaking of is is it was it hard for you to believe that that was written by an american (laughs) uh yes yes and no uh no when it comes to uh to some of the names which were made up but almost purposely off line you know no, no person would have that name um but then when it came to the depth with which he described um society you know the whatever goes on every day and uh, uh the routines the even like life as a gladiator it was very realistic it wasn't done in a in a cheesy way or anything it was very accurate there was definitely profound research behind that you could really smell it you know mm. like the way being Italian, I'm obsessed with food. Um, the the one thing that permanently features in my novel is a uh, description of the food. So not wanting to make it up, I went and retrieved the Dere Culinaria, which is the first ever recipe book that's been transcribed and is like uh, coming from imperial times. And so I could stick to exactly what people were eating and how they were cooking it. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I, 100%, that's one of the things Richard Tierney did, uh, as well as everything else that went on. So familiarizing with everyday life, you know. Um, it, it's, uh, it's such a commitment to want to go and know everything that there is to know about a society before starting to write about it. Yeah. I don't know how much time went into researching um, those days before 
he he published the novel, but it was amazing. So yeah. Yeah, and uh, just speaking on the biblical references, uh, Jason mentioned uh, Cain being a reference to the biblical Cain. I don't know if you re read this story, Joe, not not to have all these spoilers out here, but we're talking about it. Uh, in the story, The Blade of the Slayer, the Simon of Gitta story, that that's uh, another b biblical reference he puts in there to Cain because that's Cain's blade that he uses in the story. There you go. Oh, wow. Cool. <laughs> I'm gonna have to get this whole collection and read them. Yeah, for sure. Oh, oh yeah. Well, I, I will say this though, as for, if and um, maybe I'm wrong, and you know, cause just look. If it goes well, great. If it doesn't, <laughs> good. <laughs> edit. That's the magic of editing. <laughs> <What> is the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What were you doing? Were you on a podcast? No, no, I was. <laughs> um, uh, the ring is set. Surely that's the Phoenix on the sword. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, same uh, the the story directly after that. I had it written down. It may have been. Uh... Yeah, it was the Ring of Set and both the uh, the one directly after that. I don't have the name, but both of them were Phoenix on the sword. Uh... Oh, the Scroll of Thought. Scroll of Thought. Because yeah. Thought is on the the Kepri one too. The Soul of Kepri, I think it was. Yeah, that was another one. The Ring of Set. I remember the Phoenix on the, on the sword another spoiler because that's another with the mm -hmm. two uh conan stories in the new album uh the other is the phoenix on the sword oh, and, oh uh, awesome there you go and that's you know cool. the sorcerer notices that the fat can a noble guy takes out the ring and is shaped as a serpent he loses his, his mind <laughs> and stabs him on the spot um and and regains his powers right Right. You mentioned um, the uh, Boy of the Slayer or the Kane the Kane story that Richard wrote. Yeah. Um, Carl Edward Wagner did not want him using his character in that story. He had even discussed that with him. So I guess oh. Richard just changed the spelling of the name and went ahead and did it anyway. So it was supposed to be Carl's Kane then. Oh yeah, that was that was Carl's Kane. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Wow. Early fan art. <laughs> <laughs> so i wanted to uh i know we just uh touched on this a few minutes ago but uh these are a mutual friend of ours me uh john zaremba he's also a writer me and him kind of share similar thoughts on the broken sword and i understand that you know it's a norse tragedy i love the storytelling beautifully written and all that stuff but you know the theme just makes me feel icky it does it doesn't sit well with me just thinking you know there's nothing that you can do to change how this goes so I, like i said after i read it i just felt kind of icky and you know i probably will never read this again so <laughs> how, do you, how do you guys feel uh personally just about the theme of destiny specifically in that fashion you're talking about the incest oh, that's well that's definitely a part of it that's definitely a yeah. part of it i just i, think I meant it was more referring specifically to like uh, your story is written <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a part of it. The incest part. <laughs> I probably would have left that out. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it it was a bit of a disappoint a disappointment the first time I read it because you know it's such a downer. I mean, the the ending is and the way things go in the book. But I think all the the things that are good about it outweigh that, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that's one of the most beautiful usage. Uh, usages of the English language I think I've seen in a fantasy novel and well okay it is a sword and sorcery novel and it's the only one I've ever seen a writer use um, elements they're more high fan the more um, high fantasy elements like trolls and elves and that kind of thing true yeah true but, but no, I don't think anybody else could have done that I don't think anybody else could have taken those high fantasy elements, but made this hard as nails sword and sorcery novel with some of those things that were in that novel. And that whole Nordic or Norse Nordic tra tragedy thing is one of the things that it has this darkness about it that, that is so uh, pronounced that it's, it's sword and sorcery. It's not. It is not high fantasy. Right, and I thought that was an interesting contrast too. Just reading it, where you have all these, 
like you said, these high fantasy uh, characters or different types of monsters or what have you. But the the story itself is so gritty. It just there's a it's a it's a contrast. It is, yeah, it is very gritty. It's, it's a very dark read. There's like elements of um, of pessimism from Valgar just from his existence. You know, he hates his, the situation he's in so much. He's a product of. He's he's just a a soulless kind of chain. He thinks he's soulless, you know, and he's just a shadow of another man. And even his mom, his what's after his mother's name, Emmerich goes in and creates him. He goes in this. He's held her captive for nine hundred years or whatever. Yeah. She has this little philosophical passage about how your life is like like a rotting flesh on a skull. I can't remember what she says. It's actually a beautiful bit of writing there. It's just so dark. I mean, ever the doom is for, foretold, so that you know it's coming. It's not a surprise, even to the characters. They they all know they're doomed, and that's almost okay with them. So it's almost not a. The Broken Sword really has everything in it. It's like a romance, also like a kind of a romance that's, you yeah. know, yeah, like, yeah that's a romance. Thick romance. <laughs> <laughs> But you know that it's really heavy handed with that. You have to read so much romance and you're like, God dang, it's, you know what I mean? Like, and it's the worst kind. So it's also a dark fantasy. Like how we said, I think it is sword and sorcery, but you can, if you did want to make an argument, maybe you could call it dark fantasy. Like Carl Edward Wagner said, his books were dark fantasy, but yeah, it really did have it all. I mean, the characters were so interesting. I mean, just the, uh, the writing is so beautiful and, and so visual, like when um, Scaflock is growing up, being adopted by the elves and all the learning their ways. That There's a passage where he uh, he's somewhere in the wild hunt comes along, right? And it's such a, a, a great piece of, of writing right there. It's so vivid. You just like gives you goosebumps, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of passages like that in there. The battle scenes are amazing. Some of the best little i should have pulled a quote or something because i remember at the end there's this uh i mean it's got to be the last few pages of the book it's when scafflock is dealing death you know what i mean and it's just talking there's just a whole paragraph that is probably the most perfect battle paragraph that has ever been written uh have to go back i don't because i don't want to fuck it up but (laughs) everyone needs to read the broken sword if you're listening to this because it really does have it everything it's got like um a bunch of archetypal things within it. Not ju- it, it is it's like, it's like a tragedy in the classic sense. Um, there's also this element of the sins of the father visiting down on his children so hard. You know what I mean? Like they really mm-hmm. bear the brunt of, of his bad deeds. And there's this element of wondering uh, how much the witch's wrath is unfolded in all these different ways. I mean, she's created so many uh, butterfly effects, you know what I mean? Yeah. By cursing them. You know what I mean? It's just so interesting to watch it all unfold it, as these Doom characters are playing out. Uh, it's also really interesting that everything exists in the Broken Sword. Like, they're, every European mythology is true, right? Like, Greek mythology is true. It exists. The Irish sin or shin. She? Joe? Right. She, right. Uh, are in there. Um and then it's got the whole Viking thing. And also, it kind of implies that Christianity is also true. You know what I mean? Because everything is scared of Christianity yeah. coming. It moves their end. You know what I mean? So that's a whole other just kind of... It, it's another layer that's j- just as important as, and impactful as all the other elements. The book just like has so many multi-layered uh, things that you just... There's so much to... Uh, to enjoy you know what i mean it's a uh, it's quite a book well uh, first of all that i have to commend howie and jason on their description um so accurate so first of all the element of darkness right and i would even call it hopelessness that is from the get-go to the last word in the book um paul anderson was American, but he was children of uh, Scandinavian parents, Danish, I think. There is a Scandinavian darkness to the whole thing. When Scandinavians want to be dark, 
they, they, they really manage it. <laughs> um, uh, and the, this hopelessness and this, and this, it's like, um, um, the thing about the broken sword is that it's relentless. You, you read words and you go, don't kiss her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, especially at the end the last yeah, don't, don't, okay now don't do that don't do it, dude. that could be the name of the book don't kiss her <laughs> and, yeah, exactly and then it's like the hopelessness grows and you go okay so there's destiny and it's written and you can can't do anything about it so you think, well, I'm just like a mindless puppet in the hands of destiny. So you know what? I'll just call it quits. But you can't because it's destiny. So you can't even get away. That's from... what I, yeah, that, that's basically what I was hitting at. I, I could, I hate that. <laughs> and it's just, it's like, okay, I am who I am. And uh, I have the freedom to do whatever I want and I have to be okay with the fact that uh, someone somewhere a long time ago has decided all of this so are my thoughts mine um, are my actions mine uh, and, and then from there you know he keeps pounding on um, every word is heavy and um, and yeah, the assessment on the on the battle paragraphs. Absolutely agree that they are the best battle paragraphs ever. Can't stop them. Yeah, they're very, very good. In that in that same vein, just wanted to ask you guys uh, specific moments in stories that stand out. You're not favorite story or anything like that, but maybe a specific moment in a story or a paragraph that you find particularly awesome, you know, uh, an event in a story that you saw play out that was satisfying. Oh, I mean, there are a lot of those. Um, I was just talking yesterday with uh, Matthew Knight, the singer for Call of Born. We were talking about some Bram McMorn stories. Um, and I mentioned that uh, battle scene in uh, Kings of the Night is one of my all-time favorite battle scenes. And Howard even remarked in a letter to... Um, one of his correspondents, probably the, somebody else in the Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft circle about how proud he was of that particular battle scene. But, I mean, that's one of the things um, and that's all I could think of right off the top of my head because we were talking about that yesterday, but I'm right. sure uh, Jason and Joe can probably elaborate much better than I can on that. Sort of thing. Well, I can just remember real quick just something that Eternal Champion did that I, because I love this story worms of the earth so it has it's a story that centers around bran mcmorn again so you get that uh pictish mythology that no one really knows about howard had such a rich palette to 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 create from you know what i mean with the picks because there's just not that much to know right. so you get the mystery of the picks and then it has the lovecraftian element in the end of the story it kind of hit me because the bran mcmorn goes through such lengths to exact his revenge on Rome and, and, and Titus in this story. And he brings up the worms of the earth, which are the, you know, they're never really described fully, but they're like, you know, horrifying. And they're destroying this Roman legion and they're toppling their towers. And, and Bran McMoran looks at, at uh, Titus with disgust. He's gone mad from everything he's seen. You know what I mean? The, the slaughter and the, the sight of the worms of the earth coming up and destroying everything was just that uh, broke him. And Bren McMoran just is kind of disgusted at what he did. He, he again, he, he kind of evoked this unnatural evil that he doesn't understand this kind of um, sorceress element, I suppose. So that was a, it just kind of jumps to my mind. Like, Oh, that's instantly relatable, you know, going too far mm -hmm. <laughs> in yeah. your, uh, in your, um, and your vengeance or whatever you know, it's not that it, it, it's just uh and it really struck me so much that i wrote a song based on that story so great song you and howie both have great songs about worms of the earth mm -hmm. 
Yeah, what what Jason just mentioned, I I recall a line from my my song was called "Finder of the Black Stone," and mm -hmm. um, the the one line that and regarding what you just said that reminded me of was, "I gave up humanity to crush my foe," right right before the chorus. So that's yeah. that's pretty much it. Yeah, that that is a really um, that story leaves an impression. And right. what was the name of the Eternal Champion song about Worms of the Earth? Just called Worms of the Earth. Worms okay. Of the Earth. Mm -hmm. It was an Italian band, and Joe probably knows something about the Crucis. Yes, they did a, a a concept album. It was the they year did, yeah. After, mm -hmm. yeah, the year after I released Anne Rome Shall Fall, they released this whole concept album about Brandon Moore. Really? Yeah, uh, it's pretty good. Yeah. Wow. What do you know about that band, out. Joe? Uh, we 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 uh, funnily enough we played together in our very first show in two thousand two, um, but they were were very well known in Italy, also because they were one of very few bands that originally came out singing in Italian, mm. and they uh, their first demo was called uh, Fede Potere Vendetta, which means Faith, Power, and Vengeance. And uh, so, yeah, they, they've been like stalwarts of the Italian metal scene. And uh, Worms of the Earth is highly recommended. Very good album. Uh, cool. Generally sung, guys, anyway. So, so uh, I want to go with the first thing that came into my head because it's, I'm assuming that's always the right answer. And that would be um, Elric blowing the horn and putting an end to it and um, also because it, it it has it ties in with the general theme of this conversation about sword and sorcery um what one of the very first examples of fantasy literature um um going back to um I think it's the 1500s is uh, Orlando Furioso and and you know Elric goes to find the sword of uh, I think the horn of uh, Roland or whatever he does I can't remember but there's definitely a, a mention uh, of Roland Roland is the main character in uh, Orlando Furioso so uh, has that little Italian mm. kind of uh, connection right at the very end uh, of the saga when he destroys the world as he knew it um because supposedly we're in the world after right right what right. what comes after him blowing the horn is our world right. um so yeah that, that that would be it and of course uh michael Whelan with the with the green painting uh you know the frost and fire cover is Right, uh, mm -hmm. kind of immortalizes it. So, yeah, that was my... Go yeah. on. That's a great answer, uh, Joe. I was just we, we were talking about the broken sword, and there's that kind of similarity between Stormbringer, is Tearfane, right. right? The broken yeah. sword, and the way that's... Valgard is killed in the same manner as Elric. It kind of slips from his hand and aims itself at him, and, and, and you know, and bails himself. Absolutely, and 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the Broken Sword has so heavily inspired uh, Moorcock. Like, I right. mean, it must be an open exactly. thing that he says. Because first thing I thought of the first few lines, Imric and Elric are not that distant. In the, right. Actually, the, the actual way it sounds. And uh, they're kind of elves in the same way, dark elves, kind of yeah. evilish kind of elves, you know. That's right. Uh, so if there's... Uh, there's definitely heavy influence, um, but I think he even admits it. I mean, I don't think Morco has ever hidden the fact that uh, Broken Sword was highly influential on on the whole Elric saga. And yeah, absolutely. The the moment, the the way the whole thing ends is total uh, Stormbringer. Uh, what what does Stormbringer say again? Goodbye. My friend, I was a thousand times more evil than thou. Yes, that's <laughs> so good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep.
Something well, like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, gentlemen, we're going up on two hours here, so I guess uh, just to wind down and put a bow and everything, we'll just go around and give you all a chance to plug some things and say what's on the horizon. Uh, Howie, I know you got the Sword and Sorcery Heavy Metal series on the Echoes of Crime YouTube. Give us a, a breakdown of what you got going on and plan for the future with that. Um, just at this point, I just try to surprise myself every week or so, and and I'm just doing the last um, episode was Matthew Knight and I discussing the Solomon Cain story, The Hills of the Dead, and yesterday we dis did another video discussing C.L. Moore's Hell's Guard, and um, so I'm just going to keep rolling with the podcast. I've got a couple of stories that are going to be published next month. There's a story in uh, DMR books that there's a new DMR book series called Dive of the Sword. I had a story uh, in the first volume of that uh, last year that dealt with the Anglo-Saxon invasion of Britain uh, or was set during that time. Didn't so much deal with, I mean, that background. It was called um, Secrets Only Dragons Know. I'm sorry, did you want to say something there, Joe? No, not in, in approval. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, and then I have uh, a new, the well, getting around to what you actually asked me there. Uh, next month, there's going to be Dive of the Sword Volume 2, and it has a story set during the Thirty Years' War, which spans 16, 18, 16, uh, 48, uh, and centered in, in Central Europe or Germany, um, dealing with a knight who's a sellsword who has no name and no memories um, other than recent battle. And he is sent on a mission to rescue a woman accused of witchcraft from the witch prison in Bamberg. This is also overlaps in the Bamberg witch trials were going on in, in Germany. And uh, that story is called Reflections of a Haunted Mind. That's going to be published uh, next month in Dive of the Sword 2. And I've also got a Sword and Planet story called On the Eve of Zerket Bull, which uh, involves a character of mine named Tharg Tynuth. He's like a cat man. He's like this jaguar jaguar man with tusks and um, they're laser gun battles. And, and of course, there's a, it's more of a, like a medieval weaponry as well, you know, like a, a in some ways like a standard Sword and Planet story. But he was one of the characters from my uh, short novel, Under a Dim Blue Sun. And uh, that's going to be published in Kursova next month. I think the date is March 16th when that magazine comes out. And then, of course, um, I'm hoping to be able to record the next Calder Born album this year as well. So that's pretty much what's what's going on with me. How you've been writing, man. Mm -hmm. That's good cool. stuff. I, yeah, I love to hear that. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. What about you, Jason? I know you got the Sword Worship magazine going on. What else you got in the? Uh, oh yeah, pipeline? we we just released the second issue of Sword Worship, which is like a little uh, fanzine we're doing now. It was just going to be like a little one-page uh, newsletter for Eternal Champions, since we're not putting out so much like uh, inner workings of the band out on social media, like kind of the more personal stuff. And so it was going to be like a little newsletter, just kind of snowballed from there into an actual fanzine because we have so many ideas that we want to do so now we're publishing uh comics and short fiction in it uh sky hernstrom who we should kind of plug here who's a great writer in the genre a great modern writer of this uh, sword and sorcery and might be one of the best doing it if not the best doing it so in my opinion you know he's great we got him to do a comic on the first issue, and in this new issue, he's got a short story, and it's kind of the beginning of his new um, alternative Atlantis mm. uh, saga. It's really cool, um, so I hope people pick it up. Well, we we sold out of the first run of them, but we might uh, do another run of them for Hell's Heroes, and I'm just starting to send these out this week, so it's really new. And actually, Sword Worship is something I want to involve you two guys in as well, Joe and Howie, because uh, I like to feature some of your artwork or short stories in it because it's really not just about heavy metal. It's more about uh, the inspiration for heavy metal. Mm. So we're going to, we have some things lined up for issue three and four, which are pretty interesting. So 
Well, I'm certainly interested. And uh, just shoot me an email and let me know what you want. I sure will, yeah. yeah. And Joe, I you got to get that story published, man, because I've got a taste of it. He sent me the first chapter and the whole arc of of the the monk with the reverse conversion is so cool. <laughs> so I really it's, hope to. It's actually not that original, and uh, in, in that uh, there's a small. It's a short story, or um. It's not a novel by, uh, I think it's Brian Bates. Uh, the name is uh, The Way of the Weird. Oh, cool. Uh, it's the story of a monk uh, that goes on a missionary. Um, so so he's, he's on a evangelization kind of mission to uh, pagan tribes in uh, Britain. And ends up questioning his whole existence, oh, wow. possibly kind of performing uh, a reverse. Uh, but I think in the end, he's more like, uh, you know, discovering more mystical ways to see the universe rather than becoming out and out pagan. Um, uh, but, <clears throat> but yeah, cool. I, I, let, let's say I took that more to the extreme. Yeah, I love it though. So I'd love to involve you and anything you wanted to do with that. So. Oh, absolutely. I'll, I'll try and do that, especially because I started off um, uh, kind of very heavy handed, a bit inspired by, I don't know if you know this novel called The Name of the Rose. Mm. Uh, yep. Is it inspired the movie? No. It, it inspired the movie, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I've seen the movie. Yeah, it's it's really cool, right? The way yeah. uh, you you wouldn't call that fantasy or sword and sorcery or anything, but set in a you know medieval monastery and um, yeah. there's a lot of uh, that w where it becomes genius is that it teases you into thinking there's supernatural elements to right. it, but then in the end, sorry sorry for the spoilers, but there isn't. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, cool. there's a lot of uh, the the writer Umberto Eco. Um, is um, first of all, I think he not won the Nobel for literature. I think, but oh, wow. uh, secondly, he was a semantics professor in university, so he played a lot around words, and yeah. you know the whole thing is about words in, in the right. end. Um, but uh, so I started off very heavy-handed like that, um, and then I went, look, this is not this is not how it should be. So in, instead, I kind of took a step back. I started writing small, short stories, which cool. I think fit the the whole uh, character better. Um, mm -hmm. So I, 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 when I have something reworked, I might shoot off <laughs> a couple oh. of short stories and see what what. I'll, I'll probably submit submit it to you guys first because um, uh, I'm a what's it called exophonic writer, mm -hmm. so a person yeah. that writes in not their native language um uh so you know gotta watch out for grammar <laughs> yeah <laughs> blunders <laughs> the so next like, thing we're uh, working on is the split which joe announced we have a uh, eternal champion is going to do a split with doom sword so that's kind of the next thing we had. we're working on our album as well so we should record it this summer after this little tour we're going on so but that's the thing i'm Really looking forward to is that doing that. I know. I'm so excited. I know. Uh, so behind in the actually in making the whole thing, uh, like finalizing it, but uh, yeah. it's very exciting. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> Jason, you got anything going on fiction wise? I'm trying to follow up the God Blade. Yeah, with a collection of short stories. Again, the God Blade was just. I would never do that again. That's too long. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's a short. It's a short nov novella, I suppose, but really, the short story is the is the ideal format for this kind of thing. And I want to go off and not write about just Rannon. It's got to be about the other characters too, because I don't know I've kind of kind of done all I wanted to with him. He kind of served his purpose in the God Blade, and I don't know where to go with him besides that. The whole world is changing now after the God Blade, so it's kind of. Um, like the world is disintegrating uh, now the breaker's been killed and so mm -hmm. there's all this uh, 
you know, entropy is a uh, sped up and, and the, the followers of the cult are really freaking out because things didn't pan out the way they wanted them to. <laughs> and certain gods are dead and some unpredictable gods are still alive. And so, yeah, I'm kind of doing that. I'm, I'm trying to stick to the short story. So hopefully I can get together five or seven short stories and publish them, you know, and maybe put it all together because, well, the God Blade was really a novella and not short stories because Eternal Champion had been writing so many lyrics referencing the story already that I kind of had to fill the story with so much that I had right. already referenced in the songs. So that's kind of why the length is like that. But from here on out, it's just short stories. I couldn't I couldn't do that again. I, I must have been write, writing it in like a fugue state or something because I don't even really remember writing it. <laughs> and I know I was just in my back house just feverishly like writing it and then you really, you know, really going at it. I, I must have been in some some weird state because <laughs> so, I couldn't imagine doing it again. <laughs> well, gentlemen, it's uh, been a pleasure chatting. Unless you guys have any questions for each other, that's all I got. I, oh, that's I can't. It. Go ahead. No, that's about it. That's about that's it. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's all I can think of. Uh, I was going to ask. Um, I was going to ask Jason about that, uh, about the God Blade, and and if he was working on a sequel to it. But we we got the answer on that, and uh, so I, I'm pretty much caught up on the news today. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but Jason, yeah, shoot me a, an email about that. Um, I sure will, or whatever, Facebook or wherever. And uh, I'm I'm yeah. definitely interested in in your magazine. Cool, we'd love to have you, man. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Great. Love to hear it. Thanks. Well, gentlemen, thank you again. Uh, we got two hours here. I think that was pretty good. So whenever I get it edited and posted, I'll send it out to you guys. And I think Howie's going to be posting this as an episode of Sword and Sorcery Heavy Metal as well. Yeah, just let cool. me know how long to sit on it. All right, no problem. It'll probably be about two weeks. All right. That's okay. All right, brother. Brothers. Appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. Hey, great talking to you. you guys. Great seeing you. Thank yeah, you guys again. Yeah, good seeing you. You have a great rest of your day. Take care. Absolutely. Bye bye. See you guys. You are the wolf, the bringer of death.